product development. So we often want to test consumer consumers reactions to new ideas and new products. We use consumer sensory evaluation in concept development. When we screen prototypes, when we screen different plant varieties, um, when we screen different processes to use to develop or to manufacture a product. It's often very necessary to to determine the market potential of a new product or to benchmark your new product against competing products. And then throughout the life cycle of a product, there is need for product optimization. Sometimes we have to make a product cheaper, more affordable. We often need to make a product more healthy. So one of the aims of our Inner Food Africa project is to create healthier staples, healthier, um, well-known products. So product optimization from a cost perspective, from a nutrition perspective, from a process efficiency perspective is very important. In our project, we focus on the following crops, the cereals, sorghum, finger millet, teff, amaranth, maize, cowpea, bambara groundnut, orange fresh sweet potato, and, and banana or plantains. And I'm sure in the audience today we have experts on, on these different crops. But we also know that um, these crops are not necessarily generally used um, in, in modern products and they present some challenges as well. So consumer sensory testing, product development, not an easy task. What do you need for consumer sensory evaluation? You need a project team. Now that project team may be one person and then you are the leader or the manager, but often you need assistance. You need people to assist you to do the, the task. You might need a statistician, you might need um, assistance to help with product preparation, product serving to consumers. So there's a team involved. You definitely need consumers to evaluate products and in literature those consumers could be called judges, respondents, panelists. So the, the consumers which are usually not trained consumers, so they are the general public, they evaluate the products. You also need products to evaluate and we are going to talk more about those. And just two very important things to remember when we think about products to evaluate. The products should be safe for consumption and it is your task as the sensory analyst or the sensory project team to ensure that the products are safe for consumption. And it's also very important to ensure that the products are representative of the questions or, or the, or the um, products of interest in, in order to make valid conclusions. We also need an evaluation tool, which we sometimes call an instrument or a method um, for evaluating the products and then some, some place, some location to do that. So I am very used to using the step-by-step -step process and we call it the six steps to doing consumer testing. Um, it starts with making sure that you understand what is the question that you are trying to answer and in that stage you um, identify all the background information to answer a specific question. Sometimes it's more than one question to answer. The second step is defining the objective of the consumer evaluation test or task. And then in step three, we develop the plan. And this is where we, where we search in our toolbox of methods to find the right method to fit the task 
or the question that we want to answer. Then we run the test and there's some rules to running the test and next week there will be a session on good sensory practices and it's the good sensory practices that you apply when you run the test. In step five, after we've collected the data, we analyze the, the test results and then once we've interpreted the results, we can take action and the take action step really takes us back to what was the question and what was the results? What were the results that we've obtained? And now what do we do with the information? So how do we solve the problem? And sensory evaluation is really about solving problems. So to take an example, let's imagine that we had a situation where we have a company, let's call the company ABC Foods, and they are changing the recipe of the ABC chapati that they, they normally manufacture. Imagine this is in Kenya or in Uganda, where chapatis are quite popular. They've changed the recipe. Um, let's imagine for today that they replace some of the wheat flour with orange flesh sweet potato. And I'm sure all of you know why we would replace wheat flour with orange flesh sweet potato. Obviously, it is to increase the beta carotene content and to give us a healthier chapati, so a chapati with a higher vitamin A content. So now the sensory properties have changed slightly and ABC Foods is concerned that the new product will not be as acceptable to consumers as their regular chapati. So the company wants to know if the change in the recipe will affect consumer acceptance of the product. After you've collected all the relevant information about the company, how they make the chapatis, um, you've inspected the, the changes to the sensory properties, you need to define the test objective. So let's imagine for, for a second that this company decided that the test objective will be to determine the effect of the recipe change on consumer acceptance of the ABC chapati. During step two in the process, we not only define the test objective, but we also imagine and think about the potential results that we could get after running the consumer test. So for example, um, the result may come out that the consumers prefer the wheat chapati, or the consumers may prefer the wheat plus OFSP chapati, or there will be no difference in, in preference between the, the two options. So we look at and we, we consider the potential results before we actually run the test. And the reason for doing this is to have an idea of what action will we take in the case of having one of these potential result options so that we can anticipate what the value of the test will be. What type of results will we get in the end? And what will we do? What action will we take? So for example, this company may decide um, if wheat plus orange flesh sweet potato chapati is not the preferred option, they will go back to the drawing board and they will redevelop, make some diff changes in, in, in the recipe because they really do not want to lose their market share. Deciding on the op test objective is something that the researcher will, will decide on, and you have to make sure that you state and put in writing what the test objective was. 
another researcher may have a different um, test objective. For example, the test objective could have been to determine consumer acceptance of ABC wheat and wheat plus orange fish sweet potato chapatis when consumers are informed of the nutritional benefits versus when they are not informed. So now we are creating a different test objective. It's not just about the products anymore, but it's also about the information that we give to the consumers. And we can expect that there may be differences um, in consumers' reactions when they have information about nutritional benefits or when they do not have that information. So now when we anticipate the potential results, we have to consider not only the product effect, but also the effect of information. And there may be an interaction effect of product and information that we now create. And in a later um, session in our training program, there will be more um, information given about handling the statistics of the results or um, also experimental design. So this just to show you that we have to be very clear on the on the objective of, of the test that we are creating. In step three, we move on to the plan. We open the toolbox and we have to make four important decisions. What method or methods to use? Who will be the people that will evaluate the products? How are we going to serve the products? So how will we handle the products? And where will we run the test? And where will we gather the information? In all of this, it's extremely important to consider how much time you have available, how much how, how, how much help you have. So you think about your, your research team, their skills, their capacity, and of course, economics always play, play a role. We can have a very fancy um, plan, but maybe we cannot afford that plan. So we have to think about all the resources that we have available. And this leads us to, um, planning and designing a, a suitable practical experiment. And you will hear more about the design of experiments in, in a later session. So when we move on to the plans, this is step three on the methods, we have to consider what questions will we ask the consumers and what response options will we give them to answer those questions? So the response options can be um, in the form of a scale or in the form of a yes, no answer. We also have to consider um, when we design the questionnaire or the, or the score sheet, the language that our consumers can handle. And in the, in African countries, one thing that is um, really necessary is for us to develop some um, rating scales in the local languages and also validate uh, those, those rating scales. We have to consider the literacy level, the ability of the consumers to, to read or to write or to give responses. So there are various methods and I list a few here, paid preference method, that's when we compare two products and we ask which one do you prefer. Preference ranking, that is when you are asked, when you're asking the consumer to rank in an order of preference, three or more samples. We can also give the consumers uh, an acceptance rating or a scaling option where they can um, give an indication of the quantitative um, answer to, 
to a question. These questions could be posed as overall quality, so looking at a product holistically, or you can ask the questions for specific attributes. Let's say, for example, the color or the texture. And I'll also just show you an example of a method called check all that applied or Kata method. So here are some examples of, of how questions are phrased. So in the case of two samples, which one of the two do you prefer? Um, there's a example at the bottom of ranking, place the following orders, uh, sorry, place the following products in order from the most liked to the least liked product and you ask the consumer to, to rank the products. Some more examples on the left hand side, you see the classic um, rating scale, the nine point hedonic scale, which was developed in the US many, many years ago. If we think about translation to African languages of, of this scale, I've, I've never seen a published study where this scale is translated to a, a indigenous African language. One of the challenges that we sometimes have is in some of our local languages, we do not have the words to describe the different ca um, categories on the scale. On the slide, you also see some other examples. So uh, a facial scale, which is often used with with children or with um, consumers where there's a, where, where there's lower literacy, um, con literate consumers involved. These facial scales do not necessarily reflect the emotions that are relevant in, in all different countries. I'm sure you are intrigued by the the method which I indicate as the 10 beads method. This is a method which I've seen one publication from Uganda um, on the 10 beads method where they were working with lower literate consumers and consumers use the beads to indicate how much they like or dislike a product. We need more, more methods like that um, developed in, in African countries. On the screen, this is an example of the check all that apply um, method. So for example, here you give a person a product and you ask that person to check, to tick all the attributes that describe this biscuit. And this can tell you a lot more about um, the responses or what people attribute or associate with a specific product. On this slide, I'm giving an example of a method that we developed in our in, at our university where we were focusing on low literate consumers and we developed a method where they don't need to read, but they listen to an audio and they also watch pictures to see how to use a method. I'm going to click on the sound and you can listen and see if you can um, make out how to use this method. Please listen carefully. You have been given two biscuits. Drink water before you start. Taste the first biscuit. Drink water. Then taste the second biscuit. Which biscuit do you prefer? Remove the sticker from the biscuit that you prefer and stick it on the box with a smiley face. Yes, yeah, so we can be creative and Think of methods that work practically in our situation. The next 
a question that we have to, or next decisions that we have to make is around the people. So we have to decide who is the best person to make the evaluation. So we have to think about the criteria for participation. If it's our Chapati project, we need to define who is the target market for the Chapatis. In what age group do they do they fit? Um, what is the gender distribution that we should include in our test? We need to think about things like product use frequencies. Should they be regular consumers of chapati or do we want to focus on new consumers? Think about socioeconomic status. Um, where do you find respondents? Where do you find consumers to participate in your test? Always consider safety. Think about allergens. Um, people may have intolerances towards certain ingredients. Consider cultural and religious aspects. So who consumed the product? And then a very important question, how many consumers to include in a test? And with consumer sensory testing, we do not normally go below 50 consumers um, and often we, we use many more consumers. And the reason for that is because consumer preferences are so personal and you need to include a, a larger group of consumers to reflect and to be um, representative of, of the opinion of consumers. Also I have to think about your recruitment strategy. So do you invite consumers to the test? Do you pre-recruit them? Or do you find them, as we call it, on the spot? If you are doing any testing with minors, so, and, and the age for consent may be different in different countries, you have to get permission from, from parents. And I'm sure Paula will talk more about that in in the next session as well. In Africa, when we work with consumers, we often have to get permission from um, chiefs or um, people that are responsible for, for communities. So that's also something to consider. If we think about the products, there's also a lot of decisions to be made. So we've identified that we have two samples in, in the Chapati example, but sometimes there are more, more samples and you have to decide how will you serve the products for the consumers to evaluate. And you need to think about how is Chapati used, for example. How will we sample the Chapatis for inclusion in a test from the production line? What will be the format of presentation? Do we give the chapati um, as a whole chapati? Do we cut it in eight pieces? Do we serve it with, with a relish? Often we have to think about how many samples can we evaluate at a time? And we have to consider things like, do we serve samples one by one? Do we serve them side by side or do we serve them um, one at a time um, and, and then remove the sample and serve the next one? The order of presentation is very important. Next week you will hear more about how to uh, make sure that the order does not bias the response and then also how you code samples. So what you call samples and what information the, the consumers will get about the samples because all these things influence their response and their opinion. If we think about the place where to conduct the, the, the test, um, the first option obviously you have to ask where do consumers eat chapati? Is it at home? Is it at work? Is it at school? What type of facilities do you have available as the person setting up the test? 
consider where can consumers easily go for the evaluation because you have to make sure that the consumers are available for the task, that they feel comfortable. So where do you set up the evaluation? And what information do you provide to consumers? Because that creates the context. Consumers want to understand why are they asked, why are you asking the questions about the chapati? So give some context, give them some information without um, biasing their opinion. Also consider the information collection options. Will you use pen and paper? Will you use an interview style? Um, with COVID, it's it's very possible to, to do some online uh, data collection, but it will only work if you are able to meet with consumers online. And in some cases, we just use observation. So if you have two bowls available and you ask, you, you give consumers a, a small um, bite of, of each one of the chapatis and then you can ask them go and choose the chapati that you like the best and you can just record what they are choosing. So observation methods also possible. And here is just some some pictures to show the different types of locations to use. So on the left we have an interview style where we have a student asking questions. The respondent is evaluating the product. The respondent, there's no need for writing or they can just um, show on the rating scale their response or they can speak to the interviewee. Um, up to the very fancy locations on, on the right hand side where we have a, a laboratory uh, computer monitor questions are, are asked online. This is a picture that I've borrowed from, with permission from Wageningen University. Um, I always felt this is, this is quite convincing in terms of the space that you create. So they were evaluating airplane meals and they set up a lab where consumers were in a situation in a simulated airplane and they were evaluating these products as if they were flying from one location to another and you can just imagine that this um, simulated environment creates uh, an opportunity to evaluate a product in context in africa we've got wonderful examples and I believe that there's a lot of need for sensory description of the properties of ingredients, foods, meals, and social context when we use and consume different products. And we can um, obtain valuable insights from consumers because consumers evaluate products as they are um, preparing food, as they are milling, um, cereals for example as they are handling and processing a product in their home this is pictures from um, lesotho where a phd student were looking at um, bread products traditional bread products that that's traditionally um, consumed in in lesotho and how can we modernize some of these options step four we run the test, we collect the data. When we collect the data, you should monitor the process and record any aspects that may have influenced the results on the day at the time. I show this picture. Um, so this was running the test in, in a school environment. So something like uh, it's a very cold day that can influence how much, how hungry um, consumers are, how eager they are to eat a product. So monitor and record any aspect that may have an influence on the results. When we get to step five, we analyze the results. So you first inspect the data, you apply suitable statistics, 
and you prepare results for presentation so that you are able to interpret the results. And as I said later, we will have sessions on statistics, handling um, sensory data. So I'm not going to say more about that now. If we get to just the interpretation of results here, you've got um, just an illustration. So let's say we had consumers and they were evaluating how much they liked or disliked the, the two types of chapati, the one on the right, wheat plus OFSP, the one on the left, just the wheat chapati. There was a five point scale, so it ranges from at the top five, um, like very much, at the bottom one, dislike very much. And there's a mean value um, shown for, for each one of the, the samples. And here we can clearly see that the wheat chapati was was preferred uh, or like the best by the consumers. So now you need to interpret the results and decide, OK, what is the take action step? In the take action in step six, we consider the original question, the problem that we identified, we think about the test objective that we set. So we test the hypothesis. We take into account the plan that was used for the test. We consider how the test was run and what aspects influ could have influenced results. We consider the method, the statistical method that we use to analyze the results. And then we make a final conclusion and recommendation and that is the, the step six. So that was a lot of information. Um, we've got a few minutes for questions. I'm going to ask James to, to handle the questions, please. Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Riet. That was uh, very insightful and interesting indeed. Uh, <laughs> I know you were struggling to try and condense all the information from your experience and expertise acquired over the years. So well done for, for, for the good job. Uh, can we have questions please from our participants? I did not see any from the chat at the moment, but we are free to raise up our hands and please ask the question. I note, uh, James, somebody was asking whether the whether they will have access to the recording. Um, yes. Yes, yes. They will have access to 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 the recordings going forward. Even now, we are record we are, we are recording. I have to apologize that we lost about five or so minutes uh, in in recording for the first session, but throughout the, there will be recordings. So there's a question from Paula, I see. Paula? Yes, thank you, Riet, for a wonderful uh, overview. Very clear. Uh, I was wondering, and also in the light of the, 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 the class I'm teaching in the next hour, uh, about uh, consent from a low literacy attendance. You presented some examples of how to run the test uh, with low literacy attendant. Is there a procedure that you are aware of how to record their consent for participation? Um, I, I may have to think about that one. I know that in our university there is where you, for example, have a thumbprint. So mm -hmm. a person can give a thumbprint or you have confirmation from the interviewer that the person that cannot write um, has given verbal consent. Very good. Yeah. Per perhaps there's others in the audience that may have uh, some ideas as well, but that's what I can think of now. Thanks, Rit. Any other question, colleagues? 
from the participants? There's a question from Def Define. And I, 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 I'm just surprised I don't see them. Yes, you are welcome, Define. Please go ahead. Define, we, we cannot hear your question yet. I see her uh, sh uh, mic is unmuted, but we don't hear the sound, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Perhaps you can put your question in, in the chat. I am very interested to, to find out from the participants what type of products they are working on in, in their countries or in their contexts. So. I have a question on my side. It's uh, Nozuko speaking from South Africa. Yes. Mm. Yeah. With regards to the low literature consumers, I'd like to know if you've actually made use of descriptive tests um, with the low literate consumers. I know you made an example with the 10 beats um, method that you've used in Uganda. So I just want to find out if you've used descriptive tests. And um, my second question, uh, building on that, um, how did you find uh, coming up with descriptors and the language barrier? How did you mitigate that? So the, uh, let's handle the language barrier. Obviously, you can do that with, a, with someone that is familiar with, with the language. So you have an interpreter or a translator. So I don't see the language as a barrier. I have not done classical descriptive test with low literate consumers, but um, that's that's an interesting concept. Um, if you can find a way to for a consumer or for a panelist, so I, I suppose you are you want to use low literate trained panelists, you want to train them to do descriptive sensory testing. Is that right, Nosuka? Yes, that's correct. So I'm um, currently there's a project that I'm work uh, I'm, I'm actually about to work on for low LSM. And ideally I want to actually um, get some key pointers in terms of what are the critical indicators in terms of sensory when it comes to taste when it comes to texture so i want to establish in terms of what are, what are, what's important for them when it comes to the specific but without getting too technical and complex in establishing that and i, I just want so it, it was quite interesting for me to 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 find out if maybe you've utilized descriptive tests and i would like to know maybe what are the strategies you want would have implemented. Um, it's still a study that I'm yet to actually build as well from my side. This is uh, interesting. Do you want to establish from consumers what are the key attributes that drive preference? Is that? Um, first, firstly, um, yes, um, yes, yes, I want to establish that. Um, I understand the current test that I can use, but it's always quite tricky when it comes to low LSM uh, consumers because you still want to establish what really is is their preference. What do they associate with um, a typical good taste? What do they associate with what um, appeals to them with specific uh, product? So that's why I'm, I'm, I'm coming to the descriptive test and um, understanding that you've indicated that you haven't done it, it's more of uh, the preference testing that you normally utilize with it. So I'm just interested in, in doing descriptive there, uh, if maybe there's any studies or learnings that I can um, get from other countries like the Ugandans, the Kenyans, um, you know, um, the Ethiopian uh, countries, if they've done any projects around that. I think we would classify that as a, as a consumer task, not okay. necessarily a, a a descriptive task, but um, using consumers to give you information about drivers of liking or disliking, and probably an interview with a consumer would would be 
the best option there if it's a low literate consumer. So you could have a list of attributes. The method that I refer to, the Kata method, so the check all apply, you could, for example, state which, which of the following attributes um, do you want in a product and do you not want in a product? Um, but an interview style with, with a, I, I think that would work best with low literate consumers. Thank you very much. Good question, thank you. I Thank you very much for that question. Uh, it seems our time is running up, uh, but I saw a question. I, I'm not sure if you can quickly uh, address it yet from Daphne Nakiwala, which says about the factors affecting sensory analysis. You said hunger can be one of them. How can such factors be controlled? That's one. It's a long one, but I think given the time that we have, maybe you can pass yes. on to this one. Yes, I think that's a very important question. Um, oh, oh yet yeah. she says, because I, I have seen situations where people go to participate in sensor analysis simply because they are hungry. Also, what are the other factors that affect sensor analysis? That's complete. Very good question. Um, and, and this is a reality. Sometimes people will respond in one way when they are hungry and respond in another way when they are um, not so hungry. One way to handle that is you could give someone a snack or something to eat before they do the actual evaluation. So make sure that they are not overly hungry and will just give a positive response because they've received something to eat. Um, maybe also good to consider the time of day when you do the test. So uh, those are two options that I can, can think of for now. But it's an important factor to consider. Then I see a question. I'm interested in the, the beading method. How is it done? So the, the paper that I read about the 10 beads method in Uganda was, it was more in a nutrition study where they were asking how much are you, for example, prepared to pay for a certain product. So it's really just using the beads as a measuring instrument to show. So you give one bead when you don't like a product and you give 10 beads when you when you like a product. So it's it's a tool that is easy to understand by uh, perhaps lower literate consumers. But I, I think we, we often give five stars. After this meeting, you are going to get, um, normally they ask you what was the quality of the meeting like? And it's five stars, three stars, two stars. So it's that same concept of scoring um, in terms of qu a quantity. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Riet, for the wonderful presentation. I think we can stop this uh, present session. We have five minutes before we attend the next session. We need to go to the next link and start prepare for the next uh, session. Uh, thank you so much. We are stopping the recording now. Thank you. Thank you. And just for the audience, um, so there's a, a new link for the next presentation. You need to leave and then click on the new link for the next presentation. Thank you for that, Rian.